Hi everyone, I'm Evan Friedman and I'll be talking about low back pain and uh, how we uh, go about evaluating it and how we treat it. So uh, just to start, we're going to go over common causes for low back pain, again how we evaluate the low back pain and then ultimately how we go about treating low back pain. So low back pain is very common, um, anywhere up to 84% of people at some point were going to have pain in their low back. Uh, there's a lot of different risk factors, but common ones are um, age, uh, weight, uh, smoking, uh, physically uh, strenuous work, and uh, trauma as well. When we look at uh, low back pain, we classify it into uh, acute, subacute, and chronic. So acute is less than four weeks. Subacute means four to 12 weeks, and chronic is greater than 12 weeks. And usually, the there are different causes which fall into these categories, and how we go about treating it is different. So this is kind of uh, lumbar spine 101. It's a pretty busy slide here, but um, this kind of shows you the basic. Uh, uh, structure of the lumbar spine and there are specific um, uh, structures that we look at uh, in particular are the discs which are these uh, between the vertebral bodies and here we look at what's called the facet joints which are these little joints which essentially connect each level of the spine and then as I'll show you in other slides that we look at the nerve roots which come out of these little holes in the side of the spine uh, common cause for pain is spinal stenosis and when we look at spinal stenosis we look at this canal in here where all the nerves travel through and I'll kind of go over how the spinal stenosis can manifest and uh, what kind of treatments we can do for this. So this is another view of specifically the nerve roots and so it's showing how the nerve roots exit the spine and at each level of the lumbar spine there's a different nerve root which uh, provides strength and sensation to the legs. So first structure to kind of go over is the facet joints. So the facet joints are little joints which uh, basically connect each level of the spine and so they're formed by the uh, levels above and below and there, there is a facet joint on each side of the spine. Um, we see arthritis in the facet joints most commonly in patients greater than 40 but there's varying degrees of arthritis you can see it at, at really at any age. So how this may manifest is an aching, throbbing, sharp pain. Typically, this worsens with activity, um, specifically when patients uh, extend their back or kind of bending backward into the side. This can flare up the pain. The pain can refer to the buttocks and thighs. Um, Okay, so the next topic is what we call lumbar radiculopathy, and the common term for this is sciatica. Uh, and so basically what this means is that n uh, the nerves that are coming out of the spinal canal are being irritated, commonly from uh, herniations of the discs which compress on the nerves, and essentially cause pain uh, into the legs. So the, the most common segments are the bottom two segments, the L4-5 and the L5-S1 uh, levels. So what this diagram is showing is a uh, disc where there is a herniation and what tends to happen is that when there is a disc herniation it, it tends to go to one side or the other and as it's shown here it can press on the nerve root and that can cause uh, pain, weakness, numbness down into the legs. So again, common cause, the common symptoms of lumbar radiculopathy or, or the typical sciatica pain is, is pain going down the legs. It's usually described as a burning, electric, sharp, uh, tingling sensation. Um, if there is uh, severe impingement in the nerve roots, it can 
you can see weakness and numbness in the legs. So uh, as I mentioned before, there are essentially a nerve root exiting the spine at every level. And so there's five lumbar segments, uh, L1 through uh, L5. And when the, at each level, these nerves affect uh, different parts of the leg. And so it really depends on which nerve roots are being affected. Uh, commonly, people have pain going down the back of the leg, and that can be related to an uh, S1 nerve root impingement or uh, L5 at, at L5-S1 segment. So different levels have different uh, symptoms, and in depending on where your pain is in the leg, uh, it can kind of help us uh, identify what specific segment is uh, being affected, and then we can gear our treatments towards that specifically. So this slide is looking at uh, uh, the discs in the lumbar spine. So degenerative disc disease is a uh, very common; we see it all the time, um, and. This diagram kind of shows different variations of uh, arthritis of the discs. So at the top here, there's a, basically a normal disc. Uh, at the level below here, it shows a slightly degenerated disc. Um, and this is different from bulging discs or herniated discs, where essentially part of the disc is, is uh, um, protruding outward. and, and during these times can press on nerve roots, which can then cause pain down the legs. When there's a lot of arthritis in the, within the discs, people can develop what's called osteophytes, which are essentially these little uh, bony overgrowths, uh, which occur between the segments. So as I mentioned, so spinal stenosis is a condition where the central canal, where all the nerves travel through, um, are, are being uh, basically, uh, for lack of a better word, squished by real different uh, arthritic conditions. So common causes are arthritis uh, disc protrusions, uh, arthritis of the facet joints. There's a ligament which uh, is within the canal called the ligamentum flavum, and what can happen as people age is that it uh, hypertrophies, and another word for that is essentially thickens, and puts more pressure onto the nerve roots. There's also a condition called uh, spondylolisthesis, where essentially one level is translated forward or backward in, in respect to the other level, and this can also put pressure on the nerve roots depending on the severity of the spondylolisthesis. So, Basic symptoms that you're going to see with patients with spinal stenosis, again, pain, pain in the legs, uh, weakness, numbness in the legs, and sometimes even if the tip of the spinal cord, which is called the conus medullaris, is affected, you can have difficulties controlling your bowel and bladder function. Um, this is usually not a subtle thing. It's uh, people develop numbness in the uh, genital region and uh, essentially can um, go to the bathroom without even knowing it. Um, so that's when there's really severe stenosis. Um, typical symptoms with patients with spinal stenosis is that the symptoms will worsen with prolonged standing, with uh, prolonged walking in particular, and will get better when you're sitting or bending forward. A common um, sign that we look at is the shopping cart sign where uh, when you go to the market and you grab onto a shopping cart and you kind of flex your, your, uh, your spine forward, it relieves some of that pressure and it, it relieves the pain and sometimes the ability to walk for long distances. Uh, another common cause of uh, back pain, this is usually in the acute to subacute range and that uh, either less than four weeks or four to 12 week period are fractures. Uh, common causes for fractures uh, are uh, trauma, which usually related to falls, sometimes chronic steroid use, uh, cancer can cause fractures, and uh, patients who develop thin, uh, thinning of their bones or osteoporosis are more, are more prone to these kind of uh, fractures. So the pain is usually fairly acute. Uh, 
and can be very severe uh, for some patients. What can happen is if there is a fragmentation of the bones uh, related to the fracture, it can cause uh, nerve impingement, which can then cause symptoms into the legs, including uh, you know, pain, weakness, and numbness. So other common causes of, of back pain, sometimes people develop pain secondary to sacroiliac joint dysfunction. So the sacroiliac joint is the joint which is kind of in the buttock region and centered between the hips as well as uh, in, in between the lumbar spine. Um, sometimes hip pain can mimic uh, back in le uh, radicular leg pain. There are uh, muscle syndromes such as piriformis syndrome where the um, one of the big muscles in sort of the buttock gluteal region can become inflamed for a variety of reasons and can cause pain and scoliosis or curvature of the spine can also cause pain. So when I'm evaluating someone uh, in clinic, what I want to do is get some basic history as to what's going on. Um, so we're looking at where is the pain, how long has it been going on for, what's the severity, um, is there any uh, neurologic dysfunction such as weakness, numbness, bowel or bladder dysfunction, uh, difficulties with walking as I mentioned. Um, and then I like to look into, you know, how are the current symptoms different from prior, is this a new thing, is this an, a, an exacerbation of a prior uh, condition. Um, is there a cancer history? And in general, what treatments have, has a patient undergone previously, such as therapy or injections or medications, and even if they've had previous surgery? So we talk um, about red flag symptoms, and these are the symptoms that I, I get concerned that something more severe is going on. Um, in the red flag symptoms can uh, be unintentional weight loss, night sweats, fever, nighttime pain. These are all kind of indicative of cancer related uh, syndromes. And then I look again for neurologic dysfunction. Is there weakness? Is there numbness in their legs? Is there pain shooting into the legs? Uh, is there any bowel or bladder control issues? So we'll do a brief phys uh, physical examination, basic vital signs, uh, doing a neurologic exam where we're testing the strength, testing uh, how uh, the sensation, looking at uh, reflexes, looking at how you walk. Uh, we're looking at the spine, how, uh, what's the range of motion, is there pain to palpation? Um, there are different maneuvers that I, I do uh, in exam that can uh, stress different parts of the spine and then can lead me to a conclusion as to where the pain is coming from. In general, uh, we don't do lab work for uh, routine evaluation of back pain, but if there is concern for an inflammatory condition, an infection, cancer, I might look at uh, uh, CBC, which looks at the basic uh, white cells, blood counts, uh, ESR and CRP levels are uh, essentially uh, levels of, of inflammation within the body, and so that can kind of help uh, point me towards the diagnosis in certain cases. The crux of the workup is imaging. Um, normally, if a patient is having um, you know, initial workup for their pain or just what we call axial pain where it's just in the back and no, no neurologic symptoms. We look at x-rays. The x-rays are good at looking at the alignment of the spine, uh, what the, if the vertebral bodies are normal, looking at the basic uh, uh, disc spaces, see if there's any degeneration. Um, if a patient is having uh, any kinds of symptoms of nerve impingement where, again, the pain is you know, raiding down the legs or there's weakness or there's numbness, usually we recommend proceeding with an MRI study. So the MRI gives a better definition of the soft tissues so you can really get a good picture of the discs. You can see is, if there are any nerve impingement. Uh, you can see the ligaments and muscles and other soft tissues better on the MRIs compared to the x-rays. A CT scan is... Um, 
can also be useful uh, for patients looking at the, uh, the bones, the discs, uh, and to a lesser degree, the nerves, uh, especially if a patient has a pacemaker or defibrillator where an MRI is contraindicated. So treatments, you know, generally, again, uh, prolonged bed rest is not recommended. Um, some people, sometimes we use uh, braces, and uh, sometimes a lot of patients ask me about what mattress to use. Uh, there isn't necessarily one, one that works better than others, but essentially you want to find one that's uh, 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 comfortable for you. Um, when talking about medications, uh, there are multiple different medications we can use for pain. Uh, NSAIDs are anti-inflammatories. The co common ones people know about are Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen, and uh, sometimes we prescribe uh, uh, prescription strength anti-inflammatories such as Celebrex or Meloxicam. In general, we like to use the anti-inflammatories for short periods of time um, because with prolonged use, it can affect the kidneys and sometimes cause stomach ulcers. And there is a uh, increased risk of stroke and heart attack with prolonged use, and this is usually on the order of years. Um, Tylenol, of course, is a common treatment which can be helpful, um, but we have to caution uh, Tylenol use in patients who have liver disease, but in general, it's a safe medication to use. Um, sometimes when patients present with acute back pain and muscle spasms, we try muscle relaxers. The common ones are Flexeril, Tizanidine, Baclofen, Robaxin. Um, the most common cause uh, side effect with the muscle relaxers are sedation, and they do have a black box warning for patients older than 65 as they can increase the risk of falls. Um, there's also a medication called Valium, uh, which is a in the category of benzodiazepines, similar, kind of a cousin of uh, medications like Ativan. Um, in general, this has kind of fallen out of favor. We try not to use these kind of medications anymore because of the addiction potential and other uh, really can cause sedation and can be unsafe to use in combination with other medications such as narcotics. Um, Soma is a medication that we used uh, in the past, again, we don't use this one as much. It's fallen out of favor because of the addiction potential and it can cause, uh, it can be unsafe with uh, other uh, medications such as narcotics or benzodiazepines. So in general, we try to stay away from this one unless uh, other medications have failed. Common medications we use for nerve-related pain are anti-epileptic medications. Uh, so in this case, we're not using them for seizures. We, they actually work fairly well for nerve-related pain. Uh, the uh, common ones we use are gabapentin and uh, Lyrica. The other names for them are Neurontin and Pregabalin. Um, and uh, these are fairly safe medications, um, uh, but sometimes are not uh, effective at low doses and you have to try trade up on the, on the medication until we see an effect. Uh, there are side effects. The main one is sedation. Uh, there can be weight gain, swelling in the legs, and sometimes even depressive symptoms uh, on the higher doses. So that's something we look out for if a patient has a baseline history of depression. It can be very effective medications, especially for nerve-related pain. There are antidepressant medications, which again, in this case, are not used for depression. Um, some of them, uh, the, the common ones we use are amitriptyline, nortriptyline, Cymbalta, and Cymbalta has actually been shown to help with musculoskeletal pain. But in general, we use these medications for uh, nerve-related pain. Uh, they can be helpful and can be helpful with patients with comorbid uh, conditions, such as if they are depressed, uh, that can help treat both their pain and their depression. Um, there are side effects of these medications such as uh, sedation and cause a lot of dry, dry eyes, dry mouth, sometimes urinary retention, constipation, um, in severe cases, cardiac issues, but um, in general are, are fairly safe medications to use. Um, in terms of sort of our last resort medications, when a patient's having severe pain, we sometimes use short courses of opioids. Um, again, there is a high abuse potential uh, 
and addiction potential with these medications, and so we try to uh, limit their use for only severe uh, acute pain. Uh, there are a lot of side effects. Uh, common ones are, are sedation, constipation. Uh, sometimes they can affect uh, your endocrine function, your testosterone levels. Um, they are associated with um, um, bad outcomes, in, including uh, death if people overutilize them. So we, we definitely uh, keep a close eye on our patients who use these medications and, and try to use them as safely as possible. In general, we try to avoid uh, uh, benzodiazepines, alcohol, and illicit drugs when you're using opioids because the combination can be unsafe and, and can kill, kill you. So beyond medication uh, management, we, we do uh, normally try a course of physical therapy for the uh, you know, more mild to moderate pain that's in the acute to subacute range. And physical therapy you know, it does have a, a component of uh, exercise and fitness, but really you're trying to get at the, the root cause of the pain. And we try to strengthen the core muscles to take the pressure off of, of the spinal condition. And there are different modalities, such as ultrasound, myofascial treatments, traction, uh, electrical stimulation that, that physical therapists can do to help break up those pain cycles and to uh, get patients feeling better. So we also do uh, many minimally invasive treatments for uh, spine-related conditions. Uh, a common one is epidural steroid injections, and this is common um, for treatments uh, of patient with uh, acute pain related to uh, nerve impingement, usually from disc protrusions. And the, what we inject uh, into the spine is a is usually a combination of uh, a local anesthetic such as lidocaine as well as steroids. Uh, the other common term for steroids is cortisone, basically the same thing. So cortisone is a, is a potent anti-inflammatory which reduces the swelling and inflammation around the irritated nerve root. There's different ways of doing the uh, epidural injections. A uh, common way we do it is from the side, it's called a transferaminal approach. Um, this is helpful for patients who have uh, pain on one side where you can specifically target the nerve root which is being irritated and inject medication directly onto that nerve root. We can also go through the, uh, kind of through the center, it's called the translaminar or interlaminar approach and this can work well for patients who have uh, uh, pain equally on both sides. And then the other way we can do the injection is called a caudal epidural or essentially you're putting a needle through the bottom of the epidural space. And this is particularly effective for patients who have had uh, previous lumbar surgery where you can't easily get a needle in uh, to the spine because of their surgery, surgical hardware. And also for patients who have uh, really severe spinal stenosis, it can be a helpful uh, uh, way of doing the procedure. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is a patient who has a couple needles in their spine in their spine. Uh, we use an x-ray machine to guide the needle to where the nerve lives and inject medication on it. And so this is, this is the, how it looks like in, in real time and this is how it looks like under the x-ray machine. So what you're seeing here is the needle going underneath uh, into this uh, hole called the foramen and they're injecting contrast dye which is showing spread along the nerve root. So this is an uh, effective technique for patients with uh, pain usually on one side. Common uh, side effects from the procedure, um, soreness at the injection site, sometimes the pain can flare up temporarily. There are uh, steroid uh, effects including facial flushing, sometimes increased blood sugar. If uh, the epidural needle goes into where the spinal fluid uh, uh, lives. Sometimes patients can develop what's called a spinal headache, which uh, tends to uh, get worse when you're standing up and improve with lying down. That's fairly uncommon, especially with the use of the x-ray machine. And then the really rare uh, side effects are infections, bleeding conditions, uh, nerve injury, paralysis. So again, that's uh, very, very uncommon, especially when you're using x-ray guidance because uh, you can safely uh, um, see where the needle is going and, and where the medicine is uh, 
uh, going. So again, steroids are potent anti-inflammatory medications. I in general, we try to limit the amount of steroids we do per year because uh, steroids can increase uh, blood sugars, increase uh, blood pressure, can cause weight gain, can cause thinning of the bones. And so there's a lot of side effects that we've got to keep an eye out for. And so general rule of thumb is no more than three steroid injections within a six month period or four total in a year. So next we'll look at facet joint injections. So again, the facet joints are little joints which connect each level of the spine. Um, and what we can do is uh, do x-ray guided injections into the joint where we put some cortisone. Risks and benefits are similar to the epidural injections. And this is a diagram showing a needle. Uh, this is under the x-ray machine. So this Lucency right here is where the joint is, and this is the needle, which is going directly into the joint. Um, and this is a little model of it on the other side, basically showing the same thing. So this is a very common, straightforward procedure. Um, there are also other procedures we can do for facet-mediated pain, uh, one of which is called radiofrequency ablation. Commonly, people refer to this as burning of the nerves. So what you're doing in, in this procedure is you're uh, burning little sensory nerves which supply the joints, and so you're blocking the pain signals uh, to the arthritic joints. So what we do before we do the ablation procedure is a series of diagnostic uh, injections where we numb up these nerves as a test to see if the pain goes away. And we're looking for significant short-term relief. And if we're seeing that the pain is significantly improved after these nerve blocks, uh, then we're reasonably sure that the, this is the cause of a patient's pain and we can go back and uh, burn those nerves. So this diagram uh, picture is showing where these little nerves live. So the, the joints are in between the level and then the nerves come down and supply these joints. And so what we can do is we can uh, using the x-ray machine, guide a needle to where the, to this nerve is and put uh, numbing medication to block the nerve. So the nice thing about the radiofrequency ablation procedure is it's, it's not a surgical intervention. It's using needles only uh, with local anesthetic and sometimes uh, light sedation. Uh, what we do is place a catheter near the target nerve with x-ray guidance and we can put a a uh, small electric probe through the needle, which then heats up the tip of the needle and uh, uh, essentially uh, burns the nerve. So what are common side effects with this procedure? Uh, patients can temporarily have uh, increased pain. Sometimes people can develop a numbness, burning, or, or even like sunburn sensation, which tends to resolve within a couple weeks after the procedure. So this is a picture of uh, how we do the ablation. And, and on the side here, this is the x-ray image. Um, so we know that the nerves live in this groove. And, and this is the, x, uh, the needle um, uh, hitting our target. Uh, and, and you can't see the nerve on the x-ray, but we know that the nerve lives in this area based on uh, uh, the anatomy. And so we can use the bony landmarks as a guide to uh, accurately uh, hit our, our target. So for patients who have uh, compression fractures, um, there is a procedure called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. Um, and uh, essentially this is a procedure where we can uh, inject cement, almost like uh, uh, cement we use for tooth fillings, uh, into the fracture to stabilize the fracture. Um, so I'll show you a picture of this. And so the picture on the left here is, a, is basically the compressed uh, fragment, uh, uh, sorry, the, the com compressed uh, vertebral body as a result of the fracture. And so what we can do is place a needle into this fracture and subsequently uh, blow up a little balloon in the area. And what that does is it, it creates a cavity for placement of the cement. And it also restores the normal height within the vertebral body. So we see the balloon being deployed here. And then we see the uh, 
a cement material being injected into this cavity and then this is essentially what it looks like once the uh, uh, cement hardens. There are, again, basic risks with this procedure. The main thing you want to be careful about is making sure the cement is only within the vertebral body and it doesn't leak out onto the spinal nerves. But again, this is why we use the x-ray machine to make sure that it's being done as safely as possible. So last but not least, uh, you know, we talk about surgery as uh, um, the end resort uh, for patients who have failed conservative measures, usually that means physical therapy, medications, injections, they have severe debil debilitating uh, uh, pain which affects the quality of life, uh, causes functional impairment, and also patients with severe neurologic impairment, uh, we tend to be more aggressive in, uh, in fixing those conditions because we don't want the neurologic impairment to become permanent. So that was a lot to go through in approximately 30 minutes. So if there's any questions, I can go ahead and answer some. You know, in general, a lot of the preventative treatments are uh, uh, kind of basic uh, lifestyle modifications, making sure that your core muscle strength is strong, maintaining an ideal body weight, um, uh, you know, overall, uh, eating well, exercising routinely. Um, you know, some medications uh, like glucosamine chondroitin can sometimes be helpful uh, preventing arthritis, but uh, in general, um, sometimes patients can develop arthritis despite, uh, you know, uh, their best efforts. But they are basically, you know, living a healthy lifestyle and, and uh, maintain, uh, maintaining a, a good body weight can be helpful uh, to avoid significant arthritis. Yeah, for sure, I mean, there are definitely times when it, it, de it depends really what the symptoms are and it depends on the severity of the stenosis, but definitely, uh, you know, a lot of times when we see patients even with moderate to severe stenosis, we try uh, conservative treatments such as therapies, uh, medications, injections before we go down the route of uh, uh, surgery. So there, there are definitely conservative treatments that um, we can use to help with patients with spinal stenosis. In general, that's a tough one to, to tell you definitively without looking at the imaging and kind of figuring out what, what the reason the tilted pelvis is, but um, a lot of times physical therapy, occupational therapy, sometimes inserts to help with the leg length discrepancy. Um, there are, uh, you know, again, medications and injections we can do to help with uh, uh, pain as a result of those. But sometimes when you can find ways of correcting the underlying leg length discrepancy, that can help with some of the, the back pain that they're experiencing. So again, you know, inserts, orthotics, special devices, and that's where our occupational therapy friends can help with that. Uh, there is. There is a procedure called an EMG nerve conduction study. Um, so it's an interesting study. It it's involves two parts. The first part is uh, um, basically a series of small uh, electric shocks in either the arms or the legs. And what we can do is record, after we uh, apply these little electric shocks, we can record the electrical activity within the nerve, which then kind of helps determine if there's an abnormality within the nerve. Uh, the second part of the test is using a, a small needle, which we place into different muscles in the arm or leg, and that tells uh, basically records the electrical activity of the muscle, which then we can kind of determine is there an abnormality of that muscle and then figure out with the combination of that information what is, which specific nerve is causing the problem. So sometimes it's the lumbar nerve root, sometimes it's uh, uh, other common causes are uh, things like uh, carpal tunnel syndrome where you can get nerves pinched at the wrist or uh, sometimes uh, we get the ulnar nerve pinched at the elbow, so there's different places where the nerves can get pinched and the nerve study can help clarify that. There are specific injections we can do for the tailbone. Uh, there's a few that I didn't talk about here in, in uh, uh, 
in my presentation, but there are specific injections you could do for tailbone pain. To take a step back, obviously you want to get imaging and sort of identify what structure is causing the tailbone pain. Was there a previous fracture? Is there uh, arthritis in the joints of the tailbone? Um, that can also kind of help lead us to what treatments. Uh, donut pillows can sometimes be helpful for patients who have a lot of tailbone pain. Uh, Anti-inflammatories injections um, can be helpful. Yes. In general, the the uh, uh, the newer generation uh, hip replacements are MRI compatible. I think in general, you, when you're looking at a mattress, you sort of want to find one that uh, I guess kind of mimics the underlying um, curve, the, the normal curvature of of the spine. And so I I tend to find that if a Mattresses are too firm or they're too soft. I don't think either way those are good. I, I mean, personally, I would recommend something sort of in the middle. Um, in terms of having your head forward, I can't see that. It, it depends on the source of the pain and what the problem is, but in general, I can't see that as being helpful uh, more than just um, you know, kind of being more in the flat position to, to get the normal uh, you know, alignment of the lumbar spine if possible. There, there isn't a lot of great science in general on, on, on mattresses and in, in, in pain. So in general, what I tell my patients is, is you, you got to find something that works for them and, uh, you know, and you got to take the individual approach on that as well. Theoretically, no, but we do want to be uh, uh, judicious about what levels we do surgery on. Again, surgery in general we use as the last resort. Um, what can happen when you do a multi-level fusion is that over time the levels above and below the fusion can start becoming uh, more degenerated, uh, essentially because there's no motion at the fuse segments. And so the majority of the motion tends to occur above and below the the fusion. And so you really just want to um, work on the, on the most problematic areas. And, and most surgeons, uh, you know, I think are as judicious as possible regarding uh, how much they'll do at any one point. But there are some times where you got to do a couple levels to fix the problem because if you only do one or two, there are still other issues that won't be solved. So th there are times that that occurs. But it's, it's rare that we do a, a large fusion unless there, again, uh, there was the, the comment be question before about curvature of the spine, if there's severe curvature of the spine, which is causing nerve impingement or other uh, problems, then you may do a more extensive fusion, but that, that's more uh, rare. Um, Really just everything we just mentioned. Um, uh, you know, again, when, when we say kind of a degenerative back condition, uh, you have to, uh, you know, as my job is to sort of dig into what part of the spine is degenerated. Is it the entire spine or there are certain segments of the spine are degenerated? And uh, based on where the problem is within the spine, that can help us, uh, you know, uh, prescribe specific treatments. But really everything I just mentioned can be applied. Again, it depends on what the, the specific root cause of the problem is, and, and that's where our imaging helps us. Usually within four months. There are uh, cases where, let's say, the, the, the pain is, is persisting, um, you know, despite a, a time frame where you might have imagined the fracture would heal. You may make a repeat the MRI to see if there's any. When we're looking at the MRI, essentially we're looking for inflammation within the bone. And if we're still seeing acute inflammation within the bone, then sometimes uh, you can go a little bit longer than that. But in general, I think Medicare guidelines are four months or less. There are. Uh, there you can try lidocaine-based uh, uh, 
There are ointments, there are patches, creams, so lidocaine is just a numbing agent. Uh, there are prescription strength lidocaine patches. Uh, there's a lot of over-the-counter substitutes which are cheaper. Uh, the lidocaine patches, for whatever reason, uh, tend to be uh, expensive for some insurance companies. There, is, uh, there are anti-inflammatory gels that we can use. Common ones called Voltaren gel, so it's uh, uh, basically diclofenac or a cousin of um, Motrin, and it's uh, in a gel form, and you can place it on the area. Uh, sometimes we do uh, compounded creams where we use uh, put different medications into a cream form, and that can be helpful for some people depending on the problem. But yeah, there's definitely options.